some people that I interview, it doesn't make any sense at all. Anyway, welcome to this episode of the Book Marketing Success Podcast. Today, I have Janine Bolin on, and she's the author of a good number of books, uh, some that are really interesting to me, like Expressing the Divine, a guidebook for the enlightened soul. She has books on money. She has books on, uh, I, I don't know, do you have, you have at least one book that was parenting related. And then, but I'm in, uh, interviewing her because she also has a book on author podcasting. So I wanted to talk to her more about what has she learned in her adventures in podcasting, as well as what can uh, she tell you that will help you be a better podcast guest, as well as a better podcaster. So, uh, Janine, uh, how did you get into podcasting? Okay, that's a very good question. And thank you so much for having me on the show today, John. Uh, we, you and I had to do some definitely uh, Tetris when it came to our scheduling. And so you made time for me. And I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you. I really appreciate you being so open and willing to have me on your show. Yeah. Um, I got into podcasting uh, back when we were called audio bloggers. So this would have been around 2002, 2005 with Blog Talk Radio. And I had a show okay. on there. Now, I've been in radio since 1987, where I was a DJ at the time, where I was uh, sending out music as well as talking about the local high school news, stuff like that. But uh, we were called audio bloggers for that period of time. And I was able to get sponsors. I had Kellogg. I had all kinds of different ones because big business actually knew that this audio blogging phenomenon was something that was very valuable, especially for their customer base who was very auditory. So there were certain companies that were definitely testing out the markets uh, at that period of time. And so I was very fortunate. I, it cost me peanuts to do. Everything was virtually free. And the hardest thing was getting speakers because people really didn't know what you were. They were like, well, you're not a radio station. What do you mean you're an audio blogger? They, they really didn't understand that. And uh, fast forward a little bit to 2017, and that's when I actually became, quote, quote, a podcaster. And the very first podcast I ran was uh, The Practical Mystic Show, and that was based on the genre of books that I've written on the Divine series. And then after that came The Thriving Solopreneur, which was my business podcast. Then we had Three Minute Money Tips, and those came out every Friday. Three minute is a podcast that was only three minutes long. Right. And then the last one uh, was uh, The Writer's Hour, Creative Conversations. And so at that point, my team was very good at being able to do the podcasting. So that kind of gives you a quick rundown of what it was like for me to be a podcaster. Are you still doing all four or did you uh, do some for a limited time and then stop? Um, we got syndicated in October of 2021 and we merged all four podcasts then into a radio program. We were picked up and so we podcast uh, the Janine Boland show, which has a combination of all those uh, sessions okay. together. And then we're also now on uh, an exchange where we have 67 radio stations that uh, broadcast our content. Does that confuse people when you have essentially four different topics? Or at least uh, three different topics? I did not have that with my my audience, my audience knew I was a multi, multi genre, multi book author. Uh, many of them had followed me from the beginning of 2005. And so when they found me on podcasts, they were just like, oh my gosh, Janine, we can't believe it. This is great. And so when we syndicated, we had to direct a lot of our listeners. And so we're, we're still. We're still having uh, people dribble in <laughs> who were listening to us and they're like, why did you stop? And I'm like, oh, no, we just got syndicated. And so we just have to direct them to where we are now. Are you syndicated live then or is this uh, basically a podcasting uh, it's, yeah, syndication? It, it, Right. It's syndicated, which means uh, it's all pre-recorded. So, no, we don't have to worry about doing things live. And that makes it a lot easier on me because I'm not sitting there constantly watching the clock, praying that my guest will wrap it up in the next 15 seconds because we have to go to commercial. <laughs> you know, it's much nicer. I, I enjoy being able to do it a little bit more free form this way. Did you, do you get paid for that then? Or is it? Yes. Um, okay. yes, it uh, yes, I do. More than uh -huh. just promotion. It's uh, yet you got paid. Correct. I get paid not only by my speakers, everyone who is on my show as a guest is, uh, pays me, uh, but I also have sponsors. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but the syndication doesn't pay you then. Syndication, syndication just means you're more, you've been requested by more than one radio show for your content. Okay. I didn't know if they, uh, if, if you had an actual syndicator that was helping you get on uh, more radio stations or not. Uh, actually, yes, we do, but we're still negotiating the contract. Okay. So yeah. you sort of come back all the way around full to circle. being a, a radio show again. <laughs> yes, I, I've definitely come full circle and I'm having deja vu moments. Yes, most definitely. <laughs> but it, it's also a podcast because you're still syndicating on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, things like that. Correct. We're on 47 internet-based platforms. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, that's one of the things I really like about the podcasting is the power of syndication in uh, all those different outlets that mm -hmm. allow you to, you know, to feature you. And there you are. And uh, all you have to do is create the show, put it up on your your podcast uh, platform, whatever it is, and boom, it's syndicated out to 47 in your case. Right, right. And uh, that, that's really the magic of it. And then, of course, if you want to, like in this case, I will be syndicating to a, a bunch of video and social media platforms over and above the audio podcasting uh, syndication. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the nice things I like about, you know, being able to record the video and then you can syndicate it out because uh, a lot of these uh, podcast platforms don't really yet support video podcasts. Some do, but not all of them. Right. So what would you suggest? Uh, let, let's start with, I, th I think for many authors, it's probably best to start off being a guest rather than starting your own podcast. So you get a feel for what podcasting is like. And uh, do, would you agree with that? Or, or do you think they should start by podcasting and then becoming a guest? I highly recommend that authors get very good at being a podcast guest. It's, it's kind of like when you want to go into business for yourself. And really, if you are an author, start considering yourself a business owner. You are an authorpreneur. And that is something that has started catching on in the last few years. And I'm really happy to start hearing that word more and more. Because as soon as you start seeing that you are a business, the better off you're going to be. And just like any good business owner, um, when you want to learn how to run your own business, you need to be a really good employee first. Some people will say, right? Um, some of the the greatest entrepreneurs, you know, Wendy's, McDonald's, you know, they were working at these fast food joints in the 80s and 90s. And that's what really got them going on. I will treat my employees better. I will, you know, it's where we've had so many wonderful things happen. And I happen to live in Boulder County of uh, Colorado. And so Celestial Seasonings is a company that started with the whole green initiative and low carbon footprint and their tea bags don't have strings and little tabbies on them. They were always trying to keep things really pared down to bare essentials and it took off and they ended up selling the company several years ago. And it's just one of those things that it's wonderful to see organic green, low carbon footprint sorts of corporations. And that all came out of people that said, I have an idea, I wanna run my own business, but I'm gonna go learn what it's like to automate or systemize things. And then I will see how can I uh, pare it down to something that I as a solopreneur, as a single person business can use. And one of those things is knowing how to speak not only about your topic, but then how to promote your business, how to promote your mindset. And that is what this world needs. We need people that are articulate, that have a vocabulary, and that are willing to share the knowledge that's between their ears. And that's authorpreneurs. You guys are awesome. That is exactly what we need. So if you've written a book, please share what you know. The world needs what you have. And podcasting is great because a lot of the people that are listening to podcasts, they're busy doing other things, but you can always see them in the garden, right? They got their headphones on or they got their uh, earbuds in and they're sitting there listening. And all of a sudden you'll just see them stop because you have said something that has inspired them. And so it's just, it's very important that you share what you know. Yeah, I think uh, that's why I've been encouraging. I, th I think, you know, 15 years ago, blogging was a thing. And I think in today's world, it makes a lot more sense. With blogging, 
you know, you wrote a blog post and where did it show up? On your blog and then maybe on your social media if you shared the blog post. But that's about it. It didn't go any further. Whereas with podcasting, boom, you know, Apple is promoting you. Google is promoting you. Facebook is promoting you. All kinds of people are syndicating your content and and uh, bringing it out to more and more people. And I think that that's really the power of podcasting and why I really encourage people to uh, start to do podcasting. And I think the best way for a lot of authors, because they tend to be not as entrepreneurial as you think they might should be, you know, uh, they, you know, but by starting as a guest, you get a feel for it. So you get a feel for, okay, this is what podcasting is like. I can do that. Uh, and then it makes uh, more sense. And it, then they get more comfortable to the idea that, okay, maybe I should start up my own podcast. Because when you're a podcast guest, podcast guest you are syndicated, um, uh, you know, by that person's channel, but it's a one-time, you know, hit in a sense. Whereas when you're podcasting, say, weekly, then your podcast every week gets syndicated to all the different platforms that you're on, all the different apps, all the different directories, and so on that make, I think, podcasts more powerful, definitely more powerful than blogging. Now, I, I talked quite a long there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you're my guest. I should let you talk. But I, I'm really enthusiastic about podcasting. Could you tell us a little bit about your author podcasting book? Well, there, there's a few points in the book that I think will be helpful, especially if you have an author that's just been published and say you've had your book published for about six months and you're feeling a little down. You're feeling a little down because you didn't quite get the launch that you wanted or maybe there were mitigating factors. Maybe something happened in your family life. I mean, it happened, you hear these stories all the time from authors right. that will spend all this time, effort, money, energy into a launch and it just goes kaput. Uh, so what I recommend is in my book, I list out some things that are very important if you want to truly be a standout guest, because it would be terrific for you to be able to be on somebody's podcast more than once. And if you make that great impression, the whole point is that you get on a circuit and it's a virtual speaking circuit. So that's why I talk about how to take your book on a virtual tour, because it's low cost, doesn't, doesn't, tear you up financially speaking. And as long as you can commit the time to it, it's very profitable. And so one of the things that you were talking about as far as a blog, some authors are very comfortable doing blogs. And we talk about in some of the courses that I offer, how you leverage those blogs along with podcasts so that you get more uh, effort, you get more leverage for what your effort is that you're putting into that. And so I know a lot of people are like, oh, I really recommend that you you build a podcast. Well, I highly recommend that you get your entrepreneurial venture profitable before you start podcasting because it is quite a time commitment, as I know, John, you can definitely speak to. And so I recommend that you go out and be a guest for at least a year. And that for a year, you make it a goal that you are speaking two or three times a week on podcasts. That is where I would really recommend you will get more leverage on what you're doing. Not only will you sell more books, but you really want to get a larger reader uh, mindset. So you want to have more people on your newsletter. And I've talked to a lot of authors, and it's fascinating to me how many of them really ignore their readers and their newsletters. And so if you want to really leverage a blog, you need a newsletter. You need to have that hook so that they will go to your blog and read the rest of the article. And the other aspect of that is being able to have your author storefront. Do you have a book? Yes. But are you packaging your book along with other products and services that you as an author have to share with people so that you're making more money than just on your book sales? And so if you're going to be running around doing all these podcasts and people are going to be going to your website because they want to see what you're doing, you want to leverage that interest by being able to offer them things that they're not going to have on Amazon. Amazon will only sell your book, your audiobook, your ebook, but surely I know you did a lot of research for your book. There is information in that head of yours that needs to come out as a product or a service on your website. So that was what I recommend for the first year. Okay. And basically you're telling them, you know, develop a list of customers or, or readers uh, for the newsletter. So 
one of the things goal that you would have obviously when you're a podcast guest is you say i've got something free um if you sign up for my newsletter you'll get this free thing i know you have something called the uh um oh i didn't write it down here the media checklist the podcast yeah, the media kit checklist is what media I kit offer. Checklist. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I offer that for free. And uh, and then if people are willing to pay a little bit more, they can get author podcasting for free. I just ask you to pay the shipping. Yeah. So yeah, you have so a, a whole bunch of ways people can integrate with you. Uh -huh. Right. And, and yeah. so you basically have a double whammy. And chances are that most people listening here would want both things. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. You know, they'd want the checklist and then they'd want to buy the book because the two together are really the power. I presume your checklist promotes the book. <laughs> right. Well, and, and the checklist is really just a PDF uh, document so that literally they can check it off. Because I had some people say, well, Janine, I'm not going to buy your book. And I went, well, do you want just the checklist? Yeah. It, they felt confident enough in their marketing strategy. They didn't need that. And so I don't want you to get a book you don't need. Right. I don't want that for any of my people. However, one of the things that they may not understand is that in the book, uh, it's not just about the media kit, which for the listeners out there, as an author, you may have been encouraged to make a speaker one sheet or something like that. But if you're going to be a standout guest to podcasters, you need a media kit. And a speaker one sheet is not enough. And a book profile is not enough because a media kit needs to have multiple different types of headshots of you, both professional and improvisational, like maybe doing a hobby that you have or something. But you need multiple headshots because nowadays, as John will be glad to tell you with his video work that he does, we have multiple types of thumbnails. We have def definitely, we have 15, 9 to 15 different thumbnails we have to create for this 47 platforms that we're syndicating our content out to. So we need different headshots of you. And the other thing, this is now my, my personal thing, is that when somebody comes to me, I don't want your bio. Your bio talks in first person a lot of time. I am speaking, I am introducing you. So I need an introduction. How do you want me to introduce you? If you give me your bio, then I have to spend 15 to 20 minutes reworking it before I introduce you. And you really want to make my life as easy as possible. Why? Because you don't want me annoyed when I'm <laughs> sitting there trying to interview. And I try very hard to understand where an author is coming from. But like I cranked out 217 episodes, me and my team. So I have a team of eight people that do pre and post production work for me. And so the team and I cranked out 217 episodes in a period of 18 months. So that is us churning and burning content. But at the same time, you want to make life easy for us because who are those speakers that if somebody drops out, gets ill, has something happen with their family life, who are we going to call on? Hey, do you have a few minutes? Can you be on our show? It's going to be the people who made life easy for us. So that's what I want to do is really educate authors. This is how you make it easy on your podcaster. Right. And I think every author should have a media kit and that it's more than just a one sheet. One sheet is important. It's an easy thing to send to somebody if they want to know more about you. But at some point, they're going to come back and say, OK, I need your book cover. I need uh, a shot of you, a professional shot. I need, I need to hear you. You know, some of the things you would probably have in the media kit online would be your uh, appearance on a TV show, a radio show, a podcast, or even speaking somewhere so that people can actually see how you sound, how you, uh, you know, uh, how you, I'm going blank on the word I want to use, but how you get your message across. And that I think is important for people as well. And that's part of the media kit as well. So I agree with you that there's a lot there that you could do to make it much better. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I'm happy that you, you said that because I think a lot of authors need to do that. Um, and the thing is, you know, if you're a podcast guest, as you said, you know, you do it two or three times a week. That should be your commitment. That's not a lot of time. You know, that's a feel, you know, a half hour here, maybe an hour there, something like that. Then there's some promotion you have to do. But beyond that, you know, the main thing you, ha you should be doing is writing more books and uh, 
you know, doing at least one issue of your newsletter every week. I think uh, the minimum you can do with the newsletter is weekly. I think if you go bi-weekly or monthly, you lose a lot of your audience. They forget that you exist. How often do you recommend people do a newsletter? I, I'm curious to know. I, I have them start off once a month. If they have <laughs> never, if they have never, you know, if they're warming up their list, I'm like, start off once a month because many new authors are quite overwhelmed with the whole marketing process. I know. And it's very easy for that to happen. And so uh, we, you know, chisel this out, right? When you're looking at somebody who's cranking out content, somebody like myself or John, it's because we've been at this a while. And so we slowly added it. We don't build Rome immediately. Like built, Rome wasn't built in a day, like they, like they say. Uh, so what you do is you pick something. So you're like, okay, first I'm going to build my media kit. Okay. And while I'm be building my media kit, I'm going to crank out a newsletter because a newsletter is easy for me. I always ask authors, what is easy for you? And they know, they know what's simple. So I say, do the simple things first. And once you start doing the newsletter and you have yourself on, you know, you've built out your routine, like, okay, I'm going to do it once a month. It's going to be the first Friday of every month. It's going to go out. And that's how I'm going to do it. Once you've made that decision, then you can make two or three uh, newsletters, crank them out. And that way they're on the, on the back burner, so to speak, and you're automating them and sending them out once a month and then start cranking up your media kit and start investigating your podcasting and one of the easiest ways i mean if you're listening you're listening to john's show right now the best way to do it is contact john say hey john i'd like to be on your show this is what i'm doing and if he goes i'm sorry that's not a good fit don't worry about that say okay well what would be a good fit and who do you know john he's going to be like oh hey there's this crazy chick named janine bullen if you want to you can you know check out and see what she's doing with her latest thing and if she can't say uh if she says no it's not a good fit guess what? She's going to know a plethora of podcasters because that's what she does. So just ask us. We'll be glad to share your name around, especially because we are always looking for guests and we would be happy and we want you to be successful. Believe it or not, a podcaster wants you to look good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes them look good and it helps their mm -hmm. show become more and more popular. Um, and the thing is that for me, you know, I'm looking for stories. I'm not wanting somebody just talking about their book because that's not relevant to my audience. My audience wants to know what clever thing did you do to market your book? Mm -hmm. uh, what's been working for you? And, that, you know, if somebody comes to me with even just one story about something that worked for them, I'll have them on a podcast. It might be a short podcast. It might be longer and I'll feature their book. Their cover will be there. You know, I will link to it, et cetera, et cetera. I'll link to their website. These are things that a, a good podcaster does on, on their own. You know, that's part of doing a good podcast is providing people with access to the guests that you have. But I have to have a marketing story in some way uh, because without that, I can't... Uh, it, my audience isn't going to listen. They're not going to listen to, you know, how to save money, uh, you know, buying a used car or something like that. Well, they might, you know, a portion of my audience would like that, but, you know, the rest of them, they're going to go, well, that's not relevant. Why is John spinning off in that direction? Now, Janine, you have that radio show where you are sort of spinning off in a number of different directions. Uh how does that work for you? You know, oh. how do you how do you keep, you know, any kind of focus or something? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's because I am a single mother and I had four children and I homeschooled them, you know, that I'm used to taking what seem to be very disparate topics and I can usually weave a story into them. So with the Janine Bolin show, we took those uh, four podcasts and we brought them together, right? And so what we had was uh, the three minute money tip, thriving solopreneur, the writer's hour and the practical mystics. And so when they said, we're going to call this the Janine Boland show so people can at least follow you and they know who you are. Um, they said, so how are you, what's going to be your tagline? I'm like, okay, well, it's a show about how to save your money, how to save your time, how to save your knowledge and how to save your sanity. And so that's what we did. We just pulled it all together, money, time, sanity, 
and your knowledge, how you save those four <laughs> things, right? And that kind of pulled together all four of those podcasts. So it was actually quite easy. And then each guest that comes on, I'll say, hey, do you have a money tip that you, helps you save money? And do you have some little trick that you use that helps you save time? And it's amazing. People are more than willing to share what they know. They just need to know what questions you're going to ask them. And so it's delightful okay. right now. I'm actually enjoying it quite a bit. Yeah, and that's that's the one challenge that there is, is is, is integrating it in a way. But this your uh, your show allows you to basically interview anybody. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, you know, whatever author and what they're mm -hmm. writing about. I mean, I, I could see you even interviewing a novelist. Um, but the novelist oh, yeah. would have to figure, you know, they, they'd have to fit into your show somehow. You'd have to, I don't know, do you talk to your uh, guest beforehand? Or do um, you just uh, go yeah. blind interview with the list of questions you've sent them? Actually, uh, it can go either way because, like I said, I have a team. And so my content uh, coordinator, Tasha, will frequently do a lot of the pre-interviews with folks. and Or um, she'll say, is there anything special? Or we even have on our Calendly link when you sign up to be on our show, we even give you an opportunity to kind of ask your own questions about, you know, what, what kind of show is this going to be? But yes, I've had novelists. They're some of my favorite. Uh, I love nonfiction and I love fictional authors equally. And so for my fictional authors, it's a lot of fun to talk to them about the research they did for their book. I mean, there is so much that they learned that they cannot put in their book. And that right. usually ends up, I recommend that that's how they monetize the products and services they can offer is by offering uh, research and some of the documentary, if you will, of how they wrote their book, especially novelists that have to do things like... Um, I enjoy murder mysteries, mysteries. And what's amazing is one of my authors went down to the police academy in Denver, Colorado, and they actually have a conference convention once a year where they teach writers what police per correct per police procedure is, what collect correct detective procedure is so that they write it well in their books. And I just thought, wow, that is incredible. <laughs> Yeah, it was really you know, cool. I watch TV shows and I see, well, they won't really do that or, you know, something like that. I was just uh, speaking to somebody that was talking about how you, oh, I can't remember now. It was, it was something like a police procedure on TV that's completely wrong, you know, but it makes good TV, I guess. But it's, they would never do it that way. They'd never get away with it. Uh, so that it's interesting. I, I really, I got to find out about that uh, convention or conference or whatever they offer, because that sounds like something every novelist should want to attend at least once, even if you don't write detective fiction, because every once in a while you still have a mystery in your romance or in your science fiction novel or whatever, where learning about proper procedure would probably be very useful. I think that's yes. neat that the Denver Police Department does that. Yeah, and they're not the only police department, but pretty much any of your big cities. So, you know, uh, reach out to whatever city is largest in your area and call their police department and ask them if they have a conference for, you know, writers, you know, the writer yeah. conferences and that kind of thing. Now, you may get a, a deadpan stare or whatever, but, you know, that's where Google is very helpful. Go on to Google and look it up, you know, writers conferences for murder mystery authors or something like that. And they'll eventually, uh, you'll find the you'll Denver find Police something. Department <laughs> and, their, <laughs> and their work. But it was, fat, you know, they took them out to the body farm and, all, you know, all those things, all those things that you see uh, in the CSI shows and the like um and she was like i wonder if you can get ptsd from watching all this stuff because it was a very unique experience for her and so she yeah. that's she came on our show and she just educated us on that you know i oh, absolutely cool. loved it It was a lot of fun yeah yeah that sounds great uh and um uh, it, it's interesting that you know i often tell novelists that they need to uh, you know, they'd say, well, what would I podcast about? What would I blog about? What would I uh, share in a newsletter? And I say, share your research. You know, you all had to do a certain amount of research to write your book, uh, unless it's a really bad book. <laughs> I think it's tough to write a novel 
without doing a certain amount of research, certainly in the genres like fantasy and science fiction. But I think, uh, you know, even it, romance is probably the easiest maybe to write without doing a lot of research, unless you're doing historical romance, in which case you got a, a big job of doing research. But sharing that research and things like that would be something that, to me, is a natural for a podcast or a blog or a newsletter. And you're absolutely right. One of uh, the historical fiction writers that I interviewed, we had a long conversation about a story where she was researching undergarments, not necessarily underwear, but undergarments, because there was a scene where a uh, one of the early female doctors that was in the Middle East, this is where her thing was uh, situated, um, they actually have records of that. And so she was having to find out what kind of undergarments would the female doctor have to go through and she goes it ended up taking me two months of research for this <laughs> one scene in her book but she was so interested it, it so intrigued her and that's the thing right it's the hunt it's like the the seeking out and the learning and, and the scholarship of it right and so she was writing all kinds of other aspects of the book but this one scene was definitely the achilles heel for her she <laughs> there were certain areas that and when she finally found out about it she was she goes so I probably wrote that scene a little too long, but my readers loved it because of the authenticity and the accuracy of it. And they were like, wow, that was a really intense scene that you wrote. And she goes, well, yeah, after 60 days of research on it. It better I, be. <laughs> it better be very engaging. It wasn't going to be one of those one-off. So those are the delight. Those are the stories. As I like to say, those are the stories behind the stories. And, that's and, one and of they're the, the things that make your podcast interesting to yes. your listeners, Most regardless definitely. of whether or not they're an author or mm -hmm. not. Uh, they're going to be interested in that. Mm -hmm. Exactly yeah. so. Yeah. And, and that's part of being prepared as, a, as an author, if you go on as a podcast, podcast guest, to share stories, to share, you know, what went into making your book is a very powerful way mm -hmm. to get people involved in your book and get them to want to read it. You know, one of the things with nonfiction authors that uh, was a real big problem at one point when I was back in the days when you were promoting them to go on TV or radio is that they kept saying, well, in my book, <laughs> you know, they'll say the, the answer to that is in my book, you know, that's not what people want to hear when they're listening to a radio show, a TV show, or a podcast. They want to know, well, what the heck is in your book? Tell me that. Because then I'll be interested in finding out all the other good stuff in your book. Mm -hmm. But if you just sort of say, well, that's in my book, you're not going to sell very many books. It all depends on what your uh, marketing strategy is. And so... 2020 changed the rules on pretty much everything in our life. I mean, one of my favorite things to share with my children is I can now take my phone and I can take a picture of a check and my bank will deposit it and say, that's good enough. Never in my lifetime did I ever think my bank would say a picture of a check was as good as the physical check itself. I mean, come on, John, work with me here, right? <laughs> and so that's one of my favorite, like, oh my gosh. And so with 2020, uh, basically any excuse that you have in your head, I always ask my authors, was that an experience you had before 2020? And if the answer is yes, then I'd say you got to throw it out because it's a whole new ball game now. Media has changed. Every institution in our world has had to adjust and change. So a lot of the excuses you have in your head for why you can't do something or why you shouldn't do something no longer applies. So just keep a tab on that negative voice that likes to keep you in the dark on certain things and realize that a lot of the excuses in your head are phantoms and you can chuck those and file 13 as we like to say. <laughs> and that's, that's really good advice. It really does. It has changed. In fact, it's one of the reasons uh, podcast uh, got a new life is that people were consuming content in different ways. Uh, for, for one thing, a lot of TV shows shut down. A lot of movies had to shut down for six months, nine months, a year. And so 
there wasn't any new content coming on over the TV shows and movies. Uh, very limited. And, but podcasts were blooming. They were really uh, sharing content that people really wanted to hear. And so people got used, to, again, to listening to podcasts. In fact, I wrote uh, an, uh, an article in my newsletter where I talked about QR codes. Well, you know, QR codes were really strong about 15 years ago, and then they disappeared completely. You don't didn't see them anywhere. and uh, But now you see them in magazines all the time. And part of that is because restaurants shared their menus as a QR code. You had to snap the QR code, and then you could see the menu. And uh, because people couldn't walk into the restaurant to look at the menu ahead of time sometimes, things like that. Uh, so there are restaurants now that don't have paper menus. They say, well, just click the QR code on the table and you'll see the full, uh, the full menu. And so QR codes are back in style. Uh, but that was all, I think, generated by the, uh, the, the pandemic that uh, drove people into having to work from a distance in some ways. And that's something, uh, thank you for, you didn't know this, but, you know, I'll pay you 20 bucks later, um, <laughs> was that the book I'm working on, I'm working on book number 12, and the book I'm working on is the 99 Author Project. And what we're doing is we're interviewing over 99 authors, and we're asking them the advice that you ask here on your show, which is, what worked in your marketing? What didn't work in your marketing? What advice would you give to an up-and-coming author? Things like that. We're asking authors what worked well, and by all means, tell us those horror stories, right? And so we're interviewing all of them, taking the transcripts, rewriting them in story format, and at the end of each chapter, each um, and each guest will have their own chapter. At the end of the chapter, you'll have a QR code that you can click on, and then you can actually listen to the podcast from the interview that we write work out there. And that just gives the author a little bit more leverage. And then after the podcast, we always have all the, like you said, podcasters, we want to promote you. We want you to be able to get some leverage from what you're doing. And people can then click on, you know, the social media links if they want to follow that particular author. And so that book will be coming out next year. We're very oh, excited great. about that project. Yeah. Well, so well, I'll, any I'll of your people. i interview are... you a second time. <laughs> 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 but any of your people who want to be a part of that project, they are more than welcome to join us. We would love to have them on that project. Yep. Is there a way to contact for that? Uh, yes. The easiest way to get a hold of me is through LinkedIn, and you can go to Janine Bolin, and then a member of my team will see that. And if you say, I'd like to join Janine's 99 Author Project, and if you do that on uh, LinkedIn, they will be happy to help you. If you're not available for LinkedIn, you can always visit my website, authorpodcasting.com, and you can sign up that way as well. Okay, great. Yeah. And uh, I'll provide links to uh, uh, all these things, including your LinkedIn profile on oh, the podcast you. page. Yeah. So uh, I'll have to find it. <laughs> or it's in my media it kit. Me. Okay. It's in, it's in my media kit. <laughs> and, and that's, you know, that that's really the, you know, the power, I think, of, of podcasting. It's not just the audio part, but the links that go with it in the description of it. And a lot of the syndicates uh, share the entire listing of your podcast, all the words that you wrote, the uh, links that you shared, and so on. They're shared also in a lot of the different podcast syndicates. Not all of them but quite a few of them. So that's an extra bonus is uh, all that SEO value of the links coming back to you. Yeah. It, it's quite helpful for everyone and everybody, everybody wins. And that's what I like. The reader wins because if they want to follow an author, they can. The author wins because they're getting more readers. And then as a podcaster, I win because I get the SEO value from it. So I love being able to have situations and projects where everybody wins. And it's really, you know, being a podcast guest, you get a lot of link backs to your website to uh, different places that, you know, most author, you know, I look at most author websites and I go, okay, nobody's visiting the site. You know, <laughs> it's pretty clear. 
you know, and part of it is that they they don't have any link backs yet, and and they don't know how to get them. But being a podcast guest is one way to get at least one link back to something of value on uh, of what you have to offer, whether it's your Amazon author page, book page, or a book page or author page on your actual website. And that's the exciting part of it when you actually start getting information in that way. I'd say probably 80% of my traffic comes from other websites. It's not people typing in, you know, my my link. It's people that are coming to their platform. And they're clicking through to find mm -hmm. you and yep. so on. Yeah. Yep. Um, and But all of that improves your search engine visibility. Every time somebody clicks from one site to your site, the search engines, to some extent, will notice that, mm -hmm. depending on how active they are and uh, how often they're visiting your site. And But they know where the traffic is coming from. And that's part of uh, showing that, OK, you have a presence. People recognize what you have to offer as being valuable. Mm -hmm. It's cool, isn't it? It is. And, uh, you know, I, I've seen that my uh, Alexa ranking, which is one measure of SEO, um, has gone up as I've been doing more and more podcasting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for me, I have uh, I, I, I did. I'm doing the thing that, you know, you did at one point four podcasts. You know, right now I have three, but I'm going to start a fourth one. And. Uh, the two of them are, are really short. One's called uh, Tell Me a Story, and it's short stories. They're like one to three minutes long, you know, and I share those stories. Uh, I started that because my wife wrote short stories. So I wanted to share them. And then I started to share some of my own sto short stories and poems. And it's surprising, you know, the poems have gotten as much uh, response as the short stories. So podcasting is something that can work for a poet as well. And I think that's the beauty of it is it doesn't matter what your genre is. It's just, what do you like to share? And there, if you have a passion for it and you really enjoy sharing that particular content, there are people out there who would love to listen to it. And I think that's the thing a lot of folks don't understand about that is like, if you are passionate about that, there's a group of people out there who are equally willing to listen. <laughs> right. And, and different lengths. I mean, you know, there's a, a podcast I usually listen to most days. It's about an hour long. There's another uh, podcast. I'm a Vikings football fan. Uh, you might be a Broncos fan if you like football at all. Uh, but uh, there's a guy that does podcasting on uh, Vikings football. And, uh, he does two or three episodes every day, and they can be anywhere from a couple minutes to 10 minutes or more. And I listen to his uh, just because he's got the best perspective. There's probably 20 or 30 Vikings podcasts out there, but I liked his the best. And, and you always find the person you resonate with, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. and you, you discover that. But, you know, I've been discovering some of the other Vikings podcasters. And for the most part, I've gone, okay, now I'm getting enough from this one guy that I really like. And, uh, you know, that's part, part of it. But now if I wrote a book on Vikings, I'd want to be on all those podcasts. I'd want them all to interview me, even though I might have one that's a favorite. And uh, that's what you're talking about, too, in terms of, you know, being a guest you know, two, three times a week, every week for a year, that's an incredibly powerful amount of promotion and visibility and an opportunity for people to discover you and your book and what you're passionate about. And I have to say, don't limit yourself. Uh, I'm going to share a short story before we have to wrap up here. And I, okay. I thought, okay, I'll share my story. And this is one of my favorite stories to share. So <laughs> when I first started out on the podcasting gig and all that, I happened to see on Facebook, somebody said, hey, looking for a podcast guest, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't look, I didn't really, I was really busy at that point, And I didn't really look at what who it was, but I was like, yes, 
I'd be glad to be on your show. You know, and he's like, we're seeking somebody that can help with business. So I thought, oh, the Thriving Solopreneur book, that'd be great for that. And so I get on, and I realize I'm talking to the National Pool Cleaners Association. <laughs> And they had their own podcast and it was right during the lockdown. So it was like March of 2020. And I was like, oh my gosh, all right, this will work for them too. And then the questions, you know, they we really didn't talk about the book that much. They had very specific questions of what can we do to help our pool cleaners? Because if you don't, and I learned more about pools because I personally don't own one. I learned more about pools and pool maintenance and they were freaking out because the government, you know, they were trying to tell the government, look, we need to make sure we, you know, maintain these things. Otherwise, thousands of dollars worth of pool maintenance that isn't being done will uh, cause uh, the homeowner uh, thousands of dollars in, in repair fees and stuff like that. So anyhow, th so they were talking about, what do you recommend? And how do they stay in touch with their clients? And how do they, and they went on and on and they told me all about all the different procedures they were using to stay away from their clients and everything. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was amazing. It, it, and so, <laughs> so basically I did a lot of talking about telephone etiquette. <laughs> 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 because pool cleaners not really known for their social skills i mean there's a reason why these guys love these men and women love to clean pools right and so it was a lot of fun to talk to them about you know if your person is over the age of 45 you need to call them if they're under the age of 45 you need to text them you know that there's that social there's that gap there between the two so that was uh, a wonderful story. Uh, I never thought I'd be on the National Pool Cleaners Association podcast. <laughs> and at the same time, it was delightful to be able to help a demographic of people that would never read my book otherwise. You know, so every, and they again, probably every, love that podcast. everybody episode. wins. That's right. Everybody wins. So don't get too tunnel vision on your book. Don't think you have to be in a certain type. If you have a hobby that you enjoy, like say whitewater rafting, or you like to go spelunking, and it doesn't matter that you like to go spelunking and you are writing about murder mysteries, uh, I highly recommend that you definitely bring that. Yeah, so you can actually get involved in, in many different areas where you actually can talk about something and still uh, incorporate your book at some point. So that's really a, a nice match in terms of you don't have to just be talking about, in your case, say author podcasting, certainly because you can talk about, it seems like anything. <laughs> you can talk about anything. And especially if it's a hobby or a craft or something you once did, I would highly recommend you look into those podcasts as well. I, f I feel like I can give a talk, a, an hour long talk on anything. I don't care if somebody came along and said, you know, could you speak at our, our seminar? I would say, sure. What do you want me to talk about? <laughs> and I, I would talk for an hour on that subject. You know, I would do some research ahead of time. If it's something, you know, if I knew what it was like the pool and, you know, I would try to understand a little bit about their lives and so on. but. You know, the thing is, is that we all have a perspective and, you know, I think that's enough often to share. Now, I don't know, I probably wouldn't be that good at talking about, you know, uh, operating surgery, something like that. You know, <laughs> I, I don't think I could get away with it. Uh, I could talk from a user perspective, a patient perspective what doctors should do to make their patients more at ease. So I could do that. So, and I could probably talk for an hour on that. <laughs> well, one of the things I like to tell folks about their media kit is as an author, make sure you have talk topics so that your podcaster can kind of scan them and will know. And I always recommend at least four. Think of four talk topics that you have. And so for my fictional writers, Think about the areas of your research that would be interesting to people, you know? Wow, you wrote this book about science fiction, and I had no idea that you got to actually visit a nuclear power plant because you were doing research on your science fiction story. Those are wonderful yeah. stories to share. And and I always tell uh, authors, when you know, when they write a bio for the back cover of their book, I say, put at least one thing about you as a person 
not you as a writer, or you as an expert or something like that, but something about you as a person. Uh, because I think that that makes a difference for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, there was, when I first wrote a thousand and one ways to market your books, um, it was called 101 ways back then, you know, that was like 30 years ago. Um, I wrote a, I wrote my bio, you know, I'm always being bored by my bio. So I, I threw in something like John Kramer's at that point, I hadn't been married yet, uh, has never been married, but is highly eligible. And I don't know, I might have said something else clever. But basically, I, I, I was amazed at how many people five minutes after buying my book would come back and ask, did the ad work? <laughs> That's great. You know, and, and it, it really, you know, it's something like that. But, you know, if if you are getting bored by your own biography, you you know, there's a concern there. you got to put in a personal touch, something that makes difference. You know, so nowadays I talk about my dogs and uh, that I have and things like that because, I would guess that somewhere around 70 to 80% of Americans are dog lovers. They might be cat lovers too, but uh, there are a lot of incredible, you know, dog lovers out there. And so if you talk about your dogs that, you know, I get people asking me all the time, well, how is Poe, you know, or how is Becky? Those are my two dogs right now. And uh, I'll tell them, you know, well, Poe's a little bit of rambunctious. He's actually sitting in my office right now with me. Uh, my wife goes for a walk and, and he would run away from her. So he comes into my office while my wife is walking. <laughs> but you'll, you'll be amazed how people may connect with you. And that's part of what you would uh, think about. And I, I think that in a good one sheet or even in a media kit, you should talk a little bit about who you are as a human being. You know, Janine, you have that very, I mean, given the wide variety of things you write on and, you know, expressing the divine. And, and I think, what, you have three books in that series or on the divine? Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to me, you know, I'd probably do a whole interview with you on that. And maybe I'll figure out where to do that sometime. <laughs> I would, it would be an honor. In that one, we talk about where I was struck by lightning. So, oh, that's wow. the, yeah. <laughs> so that's the hook for that particular episode. Did you, did you have an afterlife experience then? Um, I was eight years old and I didn't have oh. my afterlife experience at that moment. Oh, um, good. That came later. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and you were one of the one in a million that got struck by lightning. Yes, I was. Or one in what is, do you know the statistics on that? No, I do not. Okay. No, I do not. Yeah. I don't either. <laughs> I don't want to know, uh, <laughs> in a sense. So any last minute uh, word of wisdom that you want to share with my listeners? I think the biggest thing is get very comfortable being interviewed. And so if necessary, grab a friend, get on Zoom, and run a mock interview and let your friend just interview you. Because People have listened to enough content, YouTube channels, booktubers, all those kind of things. There's been enough people running around. They've listened to content. They know how to treat you as a guest, and that will give you practice on answering questions. Now, in my book on the Media Kit, I have you list off seven to 10 questions that you can give to your podcaster ahead of time. And one of the things I recommend is have a question, like John said, that talks to you about you as a person. And so one of the questions that showed up on my, one of my people was the, uh, <laughs> she has, she was the number one arm wrestling champion in the state of Ohio. And I was like, what? Let's tell me more about it. What is this all about? And then she launched into this amazing story that she had. So these are things that for a podcaster, it's like, yes, I want to talk about your book. Yes, I want to talk about why you wrote the book or the message that you have. But I also want to bring that human element in and, and let us get to know you. You know, let us peek behind the curtain. And who is that man behind the curtain? Who is that woman behind the curtain? Or maybe you consider yourself non-binary or you're trans. These are things that are delightful to 
to know about as an individual. And so that is what I recommend. If you're very nervous about it and you've got terrible butterflies, write out the questions for a podcaster. And then in your media kit also have the answers. And the answers are not necessarily for the podcaster, although I read the answers that authors uh, put in their media kit, because sometimes I find gold nuggets, like I'm the number one arm wrestling champion <laughs> in the state of Ohio. I mean, I'm like, oh my gosh, I would never have got that if I hadn't read your answers. And so we were able to capitalize on that. So that would be my advice for your people. That's great. I was on a recent business podcast and it was a serious business podcast, but the guy was from Minnesota and I was from Minnesota. So he wanted to talk about Minnesota, you know, <laughs> cheese and spring <laughs> and things like that. And, and so, you know, it humanized me, but at the same time, we did talk about the business topics, but we had a little fun on the side about Minnesota, you know, and, I think that makes it more interesting, especially when you're listening to a podcast, that it's not just, uh, you know, some sort of boring thing, that there's stories being told, that there's uh, things being shared that make it feel more exciting and more interesting. I agree. Lots of fun, isn't it? Yes. So thank you, Janine. I, I really enjoyed this interview. Uh, you know, so I, I will share this out. It, it will probably go out tomorrow. and. Um, both in audio and video format. So I think you have people, I encourage people to really seek out Janine and find out more about what she does and to check out her author podcasting book, which is free with just shipping. And uh, uh, also her uh, checklist, uh, which is also free. I think that's downloadable, right? That's yes, uh, it is. It's all part yeah. of the part of the same package. So if you're interested in the book, and yeah, thanks for paying the shipping on that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's nice. So uh, you know, I encourage people to seek her out, uh, authorpodcasting.com. And uh, thank you again, Janine. This has been wonderful. And I appreciate you doing Tetris with your schedule to have me on today. It's been a delight. Thank you, John. Okay.